Thank you. I, I'd like to thank the organizers of the symposium for inviting me here and for allowing me to give this talk. And to the, um, uh, I, I also give them some kudos for actually holding this particular symposium in a city that declares itself as carbon neutral. So today I'm going to talk about um, coral reefs, um, obviously. Let's see if I can figure this out. No, I can't. Um, you're all aware of the many and myriad threats that are uh, imposed upon coral reefs uh, these days. These threats are uh, direct local pressures, global threats, and also threats that have to do with governance, political will, and economics. Um, so we've had this transition going from reefs that look like this down to reefs that look like that in many places. 33% of corals are at the risk of extinction, with elevated uh, risk of extinction. So there's obviously a pressing need for conservation planning to deal with these threats. And one of the most common ways that we, we uh, implement conservation planning is through uh, reserves. And I'm going to focus a little bit on that uh, today. Um, some approaches to spatial conservation planning include uh, biodiversity hotspots, endemic threats. These are areas of, of increased species richness or increased endemics or increased or, or localities where there's lots of rare or threatened species or where particular habitats are particularly uh, vulnerable uh, from other threats. But, but these kinds of things aren't entirely satisfactory on their own because, for example, uh, centers of species richness don't often match up with centers of endemicity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it becomes um, difficult to, to imagine what, what, we, what we use in different situations. There's now a whole field of spatial prioritization which tries to deal with some of these aspects. Uh, issues like comprehensiveness, you know, covering all the ecosystems, adequacy, are we, are we, the degree of protection is, is afforded to enough of the, of the ecosystem's representatives and representation of all those elements within, within the spatial uh, networks. And another thing that, that this approach encompasses is bang for buck, where there's only, in a world of only limited kind of fun, amount of funding, you know, um, what do we use that funding for? Um, there's a whole not, another set of approaches that I, I call evolutionary approaches that really have received uh, a, a much less attention uh, in the literature, even though uh, there have been uh, pleas and calls for incorporating uh, evolution into uh, conservation uh, approaches. Um, the first one of these is phylogenetic diversity, probably the more common one, where we look at uh, the measures that measures the length of evolutionary pathways that connect sets of taxa. Uh, phylogenetic diversity uh, helps us to quantify evolutionary history. Uh, there's also things like geographic distribution of genetic <coughs> diversity and evolutionary processes. And this has been the purview of conservation genetics and phylogeography and paleontology. And this is the aspect that I'm going to um, probably not surprisingly focus on uh, today. So the aims of this study that I'm going to show you today were to examine the geographic distribution of evolutionary novelty in a Caribbean reef coral complex from the center of the Caribbean Sea to uh, its edges. Uh, we're looking at the Montastria annularis species complex. It's kind of a lab rat of, of corals in, in the um, in the Caribbean. We ch we've chosen it because of the correlation between genetic and morphological data. Uh, there's a nice matchup that, I'll, that I'll, I hope to convince you of in the talk. And that we previously record recognized hybridization in the geological past. We've argued for uh, hybridization. I'll show you a little bit of that today as well. So when I, after I show this example, I'll just go into a little bit on the potential implications for these kinds of studies and this kind of approach in conservation and management. So here's our uh, friend Montastria annularis species complex. It was long thought <coughs> to be a single species on Caribbean reefs, but recent molecular work has shown that it consists of at least three species, and you can generally but not always differentiate them on colony shape. Montastria annularis sensu strictu is columnar form. Montastria fabulata tends to be uh, massive with kind of skirts that go off the, the edge of the colony. And Montastria franksi, which tends to be uh, smaller, slower growing, and kind of has a bumpy morphology. So the new molecular data consists of um, AFL, AFLP nuclear markers, which differentiate fabulata from uh, the other two taxa. Um, whoops. <coughs> <coughs> 
there. Um, for example, Fabio Latta has the uh, 880 uh, band, and Frank Sy and Annie Laris have the uh, 920 band. Um, Annie Laris and Frank Sy are, are more similar, and they're, they're a bit tougher to differentiate uh, genetically. But in Panama, they, um, they tend to exhibit strong frequency differences at, at a couple of genotypes. But in the Bahamas, um, this, this difference kind of goes away. They're, they're, they're basically genetically indistinguishable. And the Bahamas are on the sort of the edge of the Caribbean. And, and it's thought that introgressive hybridization might have occurred in the Bahamas. Well, uh, we can look at, um, at the morphology uh, a, a little bit more closely in this, um, in this species group. The traditional morphological characters don't tend to work uh, when trying to differentiate species in the group. So what we've done is we've gone for non-traditional morphological characters and set up a series of homologous uh, landmarks to try to distinguish species uh, uh, within the complex. Uh, it's a geometric morphometrics approach that uses these landmarks. There's about 25 of them that we've established. And we're trying to uh, um, characterize the development of the coste and the septa. Well, if you, um, uh, the way that you do that is you uh, get a really nice uh, reflex, what's called a reflex three-dimensional microscope, and you can actually uh, use a laser to identify and pinpoint um, places within the, the calyces that you can measure and, uh, and look at uh, relationships among these um, homologous uh, landmarks. So we get Bookstein size and shape coordinates, which serve as variables in our statistical uh, analyses. And, and when you do the... Um, statistical uh, analyses um, in this way. Um, and we do it on the 30 genetically, uh, genetically characterized uh, colonies from Panama. It, whoops, you get a beautiful separation of the um, Frank Sy and Annularius versus uh, the, the Fabiolata. Uh, remember uh, that Annularius, Annularis and Frank Sy were the most similar genetically and we see that they're the most similar also uh, morphologically. So the uh, morphology matches the genetic data. Well, um, we can do a discriminant analysis of the species in Panama and the species in, um, uh, in the Bahamas. And what you see is with the, um, the um, circles, the, the solid lines making the circles, these are the three classic species in Panama. But when you go over to the Bahamas, you um, uh, find a whole lot more of species overlap uh, in the in, in Bahamas. So that, again, the morphology is um, is uh, mimicking the genetics, and um, they confirm that hybridization is probably occurring in the Bahamas. Now, if you go and uh, look at some work that Fukami and, and co-workers have done on, mm -hmm. on getting a bit more into the uh, fertilization experiments, looking at hybrids. Um, and looking at the potential for hybridization uh, in the lab. If the Fabiolata um, is crossed with the other two species, Fabiolata again was homozygous for the 880 allele, the other two species were homozygous for the uh, 920 uh, allele. Um, the offspring have both alleles, so they're, they're heterozygous, shown by these double bands here. But um, in the field, the, the, you don't really find F1 hybrids in um, Montastria. Faviolata or Franksi. Uh, you do find them in Annularis, but in only about 10% uh, of the individuals. So there's strong frequency, this with, coupled with strong frequency differences at other loci suggest, is suggesting that the, the gene introgression isn't occurring very frequently today. So we need to somehow explain uh, these results. You know, there, there's, there appears to be this hybridization, but it doesn't appear to be going on today. So can we look in the geological past and try to find evidence for that hybridization in the past. And uh, what we do is we uh, go along these uh, terraces all, all across the Caribbean. It's a, it's a terrible job having to fly to these lovely places and do this, but sea levels were much higher 125,000 years ago than they are today. So there's a whole bunch of terraces all over the tropics where one could go and, and get data on the ecology of these and, and morphology of, the, of these corals. So we have, here's a picture of organ pipe coral, a columnar coral, and a massive coral. We also tabulated the, uh, the platy corals in these terraces around um, the Caribbean.
So you can't really uh, do 3D morphometrics on fossil colonies because they're worn, they're eroded, they're dissolved. So you're, you're left with trying to do morphometrics in a 2D analysis. So we tried to capture the same sort of information that we captured with the modern colonies with the 3D analysis, but, but this time using a 2D analysis, again using Bookstein uh, size and shape coordinates as variables in statistical uh, analyses. So the results of that are, uh, for, for reference, um, the modern species in Panama are shown in this, um, in this sort of discriminant function, Frank Sy, Fabio Lata, and Annie Laris. When you compare that with the fossil uh, species from the Bahamas, Again, you see this dramatic overlap in the morphotypes that you find uh, in the Bahamas. So um, these, these morphotypes are, are intermediate uh, with, with one another as well. So um, we earlier interpreted this particular pattern uh, in a paper in 2004 as, again, introgressive hybridization. And it, introgressive hybridization is, is not is not what it used to be. You know, people used to think of it as an evolutionary dead end. But in fact, there's, there's a lot of evidence and people are sort of coming around to the idea that, that, that hybridization is, is really can be a source of evolutionary innovation and even adaptive radiation. So it becomes quite an interesting evolutionary uh, kind of um, phenomenon. Um, so now, if you go to other localities around the Caribbean, that, um, and, and look at their, their fossils, so the Bahamas, in the fossil Bahamas specimens, there, there's quite a bit of overlap, but if you go to other localities like the Dominican Republic we've been to, and also the Florida and the Cayman Islands, um, these morphotypes are quite distinct in the fossil record. Um, there is some overlap with the organ pipe coral, but the, but the main players, the plate, massive, and columnar forms, are really uh, quite distinct, as they are in the modern uh, in Belize as well. So, they, they tend to match the, the Panama morphotypes, the, Panama, the modern Panama species, uh, but they don't match that, that sort of overlapping kind of pattern that we find uh, in the Bahamas. Okay, so, so much for the Bahamas and contrasting it with the other localities at the same time, 125,000 years ago. There's another place that we can go in the edge of the Caribbean, uh, in, the, in Barbados here, down in the southeast, uh, um, I guess, uh, portion of the Caribbean. Uh, in Barbados is another set of, of lovely uh, um, uh, Pleistocene, sequence of Pleistocene <laughs> terraces formed by the interaction of sea level, quaternary sea level changes and uh, local tectonic uplift. The terraces range from 82,000 uh, years ago all the way up to about 640,000 years. So we collected um, specimens from, from these terraces and, and um, did some more of our, our wonderful 2D morphometric analyses. Uh, for comparison, the uh, Panama species, the modern Panama species are in red, the nice differentiation of Panama species. These are uh, three different panel, panels showing Barbados 125,000 years ago, Barbados around 300,000 years ago, and Barbados sometime after 500,000 years ago. Um, the thing you notice here, it's not depicted very well, but the fossil morphotypes within each terrace are distinct. So there's lots of turnover going on from one terrace to another. The distances between the fossil morphotypes in blue are much greater than between, well, are, are greater than, be, than those between the modern species in Panama. So these, the morphological disparity is really quite great through time uh, in Barbados. Uh, only one of the fossil morphotypes within each of these three terraces matches a modern species. There's, so there's a, a lot of evolutionary turnover going on within the species complex uh, in Barbados. And the fossil morphotypes in different terraces don't match one another. So the conclusion here is that there was a lot of speciation, a lot of evolutionary turnover going on in the Bahamas throughout the past 500,000 years and wasn't happening in, in other places. So we can summarize these, these results using uh, morphological disparity, that is the, the, the distances, the morphological distances uh, among the colonies that we analyzed and averaging that or looking at that for each locality. And what you find is, what we found is that the morphological disparity in the Barbados samples is significantly higher than what we find in the recent species. And in the Bahamas, the morphological disparity is significantly lower than what we find both in the, well, in the modern, in the Central Caribbean, 
and in uh, Barbados. So what's happening is um, in Barbados and um, uh, Bahamas at the marginal locations uh, of, of the Caribbean with limited gene flow, Barbados, is bec that's because the, the currents are all entering the Caribbean uh, from, or, uh, through Barbados, and they're coming from elsewhere, not a whole lot of chance for, for mixing of, of larval types. And in the Bahamas also, because during sea level changes, uh, these, these um, barriers to, to uh, connectivity are more pronounced. <coughs> And so uh, we think that there's a limited, uh, Bahamas are also subject to limited gene flow as well. Now, um, that's opposed, as opposed to the central um, Caribbean localities that I've been talking about, Panama, Belize, Cayman Islands, Dominican Republic, and Florida, where there's sort of an intermediate or average level of morphological um, disparity that's not any different from what's happening in the modern, not, uh, not significantly different from the modern. So uh, you can uh, uh, make a, a, an index of evolutionary novelty with this kind of stuff. Uh, we, we devised one that um, where we uh, said let's let's make let's make let's uh, multiply the species diversity at each locality by the deviation of their of the um, um, mean morph morphological uh, distance from the global distance. And when you do that. Um, Again, you see that Barbados and the Bahamas uh, have a much higher uh, index of evolutionary novelty than any of the other places. So to summarize, uh, three species today are morphologically and genetically distinct in Panama and Belize, but not in the Bahamas. Um, speciation and extinction rates were consistently higher in Barbados than in the other Caribbean locations where species composition was the same through time. And evolutionary novelty uh, speciation hybridization is concentrated at the geographic margins uh, in this complex in the Caribbean. So, what's the implications of this for conservation? Um, well, using this combined genetic and paleontological approach, it's, uh, it's possible to consider processes of population differentiation, it's possible to consider areas of high evolutionary potential, and it's possible to put the geographic distribution of evolutionary novelty into a, dyna a dynamic context. And so this is pretty important for spatial planning, for conservation planning, because it adds another dimension of diversity and process into our understanding and development and, and conservation of biodiversity. Uh, why would you want to include process? Well, most of our depictions of biodiversity are snapshots, which become outdated as species distributions change. Now, we have a paper coming out uh, very soon where we looked at the um, velocity of climate change and um, basically as a function of geographic shifts of isotherms over time. And you can see globally that there is, uh, especially in the tropics, in the, in, in the sea, there is a very high velocity of climate change that is occurring in the tropics. And so if we're trying to conserve these areas, we, we're, we're essentially, it's a movable feast, right? We've got to chase these areas because this has been happening, you know, this data is over the last 50 years, but one can imagine that this kind of velocity is going to accelerate over the, uh, uh, as climate change um, uh, increases in severity. Um, so biodiversity uh, is generated and maintained by evolutionary pro processes, obviously, and unless we plan to conserve them specifically, they can be disrupted. I take this right out of Bob Cressy's uh, uh, tree article where he, where he emphasized these, um, these characteristics of, of biodiversity. Um, threats are dynamic, climate change is dynamic, we need to think about movable conservation uh, areas. So in conclusion, um, not only will biodiversity hotspots move in relation to both climate change and other anthropogenic stressors, but so will the processes that, will, that govern that biodiversity. So species ranges will change through time, and the velocity of climate change is also going to change uh, through time, um, and especially as well. Now, the zones of evolutionary novelty are also going to move, okay? So we need a dynamic management approach uh, to, to, um, to deal with that. But the not, without knowledge of the history and the geographic um, you know, distribution of these processes, it's going to be difficult to anticipate the magnitude um, and direction of movement and adapt our management accordingly. Because in the end, the highest taxonomic diversity might not necessarily coincide with the zones of evolutionary activity. So we need to keep all this in mind. Thank you very much.